So, what makes the state of Maryland so special? Known as the Old Line or Free State, Maryland was one of the 13 original colonies and became a state on the 28th of April, 1788. As Maryland is one of the oldest states of the Union, there is much you may know or not know about this mid-Atlantic state. And, in this video, we will examine several interesting facts, stories, and fascinating truths about the state of Maryland. But before we begin, if you like this video, please click the like button, and please subscribe to our channel, as this helps with the algorithm, and will also enable you to be the first to see more videos, just like this one. Maryland is the 8th smallest state in the country by land area, but is, at the same time, the 18th most populous state in the Union. It is named after Queen Mary, who was the Queen of England at the time the colony was created. Before the first Europeans came to Maryland, the area was inhabited by several groups of native tribes. The three main tribes to live in Maryland are the Akohanok tribe, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, and the Piscataway Indian nation. The first natives to arrive in the area came around 10,000 years ago. They were drawn to the area by the abundance of wildlife and waterways. At one time more than 40 tribes lived in Maryland. Maryland was founded by George Calvert. He was the first Baron Baltimore. Calvert was a Catholic convert who wanted a religious haven for his fellow Catholics, many of who were persecuted in England. In 1632, Charles I of England granted Calvert a colonial charter, and it was for that reason that Calvert named his new colony after Queen Mary. Unlike the other colonies where the Pilgrims and the Puritans settled, Calvert envisioned his colony as a place where all religions could live in peace and harmony under the principle of toleration. Because of his fierce desire for this, the Maryland General Assembly passed the Act Concerning Religion in 1649. This law penalized anyone who reproached any fellow Marylander based on their religious affiliation. Even though they had this law in place, religious strife was a problem in the colonies. Catholics were a minority in the American colonies, although their numbers were larger in Maryland than in any other place in the colonies. This lack of numbers for these Catholic citizens continued to cause them strife with the other religious settlers, who were more numerous and thereby gathered more power around them. Like the majority of the other colonies, Maryland was a slave state. Their economy centered around the cultivation of tobacco, which needed much cheap labor to harvest. But despite it being a slave state, Maryland never left the Union. And several major battles of the Civil War were fought in Maryland, including one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, the Battle of Antietam. Maryland grew exponentially after the Civil War, due mainly to the Industrial Revolution, the utilization of the seaports, the railroads, and mass immigration from European settlers looking for more opportunities in America. The growth of the state led to it being one of the most densely populated states in the country. As of 2015, Maryland has one of the highest median household incomes of any state, mainly due to its proximity to Washington, D.C., and all of the different industries that call Maryland home. It is also one of the most diverse states, with non-whites composing a majority of the state's population. Maryland's state capital is located in Annapolis. The very beautiful Maryland State House is the oldest state capital in continuous legislative use. It is the only state house to have served as the nation's capital. The Continental Congress met in the old Senate chamber from the 26th of November, 1783, to the 13th of August, 1784. You can still tour the state capital when you visit Annapolis. Maryland has such a colorful history. Here are just some interesting facts and stories that show how fascinating the state really is. One of the oldest, still-running newspapers in the country is the Maryland Gazette. It was founded in 1727. The newspaper was both Maryland's and the South's first publication. Its second publisher was Jonas Green, who was a former protégé of Benjamin Franklin. Green was kind of a troublemaker. He hated the Stamp Act, which was forced onto the colonists by King George, and he used his newspaper to protest the unfair taxation. Green lived until 1767. His job as editor and publisher was taken over by his wife and Catherine Hoof Green, making her the first woman to hold these two very prominent newspaper jobs at any American newspaper. She was also a strong supporter of colonial rights and continued her husband's legacy of operating an independent newspaper under the scrutiny of the royal governor in Annapolis. One of the oldest schools in the country was King William's School in Annapolis. 
It was founded in 1696 as a free school. In 1784 the state of Maryland chartered St. John's College, merging it with King William's School. St. John's College is the third oldest college in the United States, behind Harvard in Massachusetts, and William and Mary College in Virginia. Four of the college's founders signed the Declaration of Independence. The former governor's mansion, McDowell Hall, was completed in 1789. The hall became the foundation of the college, and is now one of the oldest, still in use, academic buildings in the country. The very first dental school in the entire world was started at St. Francis Academy in Baltimore in 1828. In 1840, the small dental school received its charter from the Maryland General Assembly, becoming the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. The college's first two students started their education in 1841. With the founding of this dental college, this helped to separate the profession of dentistry from the profession of medicine. The first telegraphic message was sent on the 24th of May, 1844, by Samuel F. B. Morse, who was the creator of the Morse Code, over an experimental line that went from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. The first message was a passage taken from the Bible, and was recorded on a paper tape. The line Morse sent in that first message was, What hath God wrought? He sent it from the Supreme Courtroom in the U.S. Capitol, to his assistant, Alfred Vail, who was waiting for the historic message in an office in Baltimore. The first female professor of medicine was Florence Reiner Sabin, of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Born in Colorado in 1871, and raised by her grandparents in Vermont after her parents' death, Sabin went to Smith College. She saved up her money to pay for the tuition at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. In 1901, she published the popular textbook, An Atlas of the Medullar and Midbrain. This earned her an anatomy fellowship at Johns Hopkins. She became the first female faculty member in 1902, and the first female full professor in 1917. In 1685, printer William Nuthead set up a printing press, just south of Massachusetts in Mary's City, Maryland. He printed forms for the government. He died in 1695, and his widow, Dinah Nuthead, took over the printing business. Dinah was illiterate, but she was shrewd and resourceful and she knew that she could make a good living running the printing press. She moved the business to Annapolis, and petitioned the Maryland government for her printer's license. They granted her the license in 1696, making her the first woman in the colonies to be a licensed printer. The United States Naval Academy was established on October 1845 in Annapolis. The United States Navy was not very large in its early days, the first nautical school for officers was located at the Norfolk Navy Yard in Virginia. This was in 1819. But as the Navy grew, the need to train officers also grew. Secretary of the Navy, George Bancroft, established the college, putting it on the former U.S. Army post, Fort 7, in Annapolis. The school opened with 50 midshipman students and seven professors. From almost the start, the Naval Academy has excelled in athletics. One of the most important football games of the year is the annual Army-Navy game, which boasts one of the strongest rivalries in the country. Fort McHenry is the very famous fort in Baltimore that hung the Star-Spangled Banner during the Battle of Baltimore on September 13 and 14, 1814. St. John's College alum and attorney, Francis Scott Key, took inspiration from the battle, writing his famous poem during that battle. Scott Key was an advisor to Andrew Jackson, and though he opposed the war, he served as a quartermaster in the Georgetown Artillery against the British. Key also served as a volunteer aide to General Walter Smith during the Battle of Bladensburg, which ended in a terrible defeat for the United States. The defeat enabled the British to enter and take Washington, D.C. The British also captured a prominent physician by the name of Dr. William Beans in that battle. Scott Key was working on negotiating the doctor's release. During that undertaking, he was locked in his quarters, watching the battle at Fort McHenry rage on during the evening hours. He saw the flag, the star-spangled banner, waving amongst the battle fire, and it was at that moment that he penned his poem, The Defense of Fort McHenry. His famous poem would be retitled The Star-Spangled Banner and would become the national anthem in 1931, by decree of the United States Congress. You can see the actual flag that withstood the battle in the Smithsonian American History Museum. Charles Wilson Peel, a native Marylander, was a famous 18th century painter. Peel moved from Maryland to Philadelphia, where he joined the Sons of Liberty, 
and painted the portraits of several leading figures of the American Revolution. He painted portraits of Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, and John Hancock, and one of his most famous was that of the 1779 portrait of George Washington at Princeton. Peel had several sons, all of whom he named after famous artists. One of Charles Wilson Peel's sons was Rembrandt Peel. Like his father, Rembrandt Peel was also a painter and lover of history. Peel became a patron of George Washington and painted his likeness in 1795 in a very famous portrait of the former president in his elder years. Rembrandt Peel watched his father start a Philadelphia museum that presented artwork and historical artifacts called the Pennsylvania Academy of Arts. But the museum ultimately failed due to lack of funding. Inspired by his father's ideas, Rembrandt Peel returned to Baltimore. On the 15th of August 1814, Peel opened his own museum, which he built on Holiday Street between East Saratoga and Lexington Streets. The building was the first in America to be constructed to serve distinctly as a museum. Museums prior to this were generally housed in mansions or in private establishments. Peel's museum housed and displayed artwork, natural history artifacts, and other historical objects. During the opening of Peel's museum, bombs were literally falling on the city of Baltimore from British ships during the Battle of Baltimore in the War of 1812. The museum would later close and then the building would be turned into Baltimore's first city hall. A few years later the building would change hands, becoming the first primary school for the city's African-American citizens. It stood vacant for several years, but the Baltimore Historical Society purchased the building and returned it to its roots. It is now known as the Peel Museum. Rembrandt Peel was very interested in new scientific technology. One of the newer technologies of his time was the illumination of gas lights. The gas lamp was developed in England in the 1790s. Before this invention, people lived and worked mostly during the day because the evenings were fairly dark as the world was only lit by candlelight or oil lamps, neither of which did much illumination. But by 1816, Rembrandt Peel brought attention to this new gaslight technology. He set up demonstrations of gas lamps at his museum, hoping it would bring him investors. Peel was opening up a new venture that he called the Baltimore Gas Company. He proposed to the city of Baltimore the use of gas lamps as the city's streetlights. On the 17th of June 1816, the Baltimore City Council granted Peel and his new company permission to use gas lamps in the city. The first gas streetlight in the United States was erected on Baltimore and Holiday Streets on February 1817. Rembrandt Peel's Baltimore Gas Company became the first gas and subsequently electric utility company in the United States. It is now known as BG&E. On the 28th of February 1827, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad also known as the B&O Railroad, was the first U.S. railway that was chartered for commercial transportation of freight and passengers. The construction of the railway began at Baltimore Harbor on the 4th of July 1828. Charles Carroll, who was the last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence, laid the first stone. The first line of track was just 13 miles long. It went from Ellicourt Mills, now known as Ellicourt City, to Baltimore. The first train was called Tom Thumb, and it went through winding steep grades that showed off its power. The Baltimore and Ohio rivers were connected by railway by 1852, when the B&O Railway was completed at Wheeling, West Virginia. Extensions to the railway brought lines to Chicago, St. Louis, and Cleveland. Jacob Fussell, a Quaker, was born in 1819 in Little Falls, Maryland in Hartford County. As a teenager, Fussell was placed in an apprenticeship as a stove fitter, but he was unable to establish a stove business after his apprenticeship ended. Instead, Fussell began operating a dairy business for a fellow Quaker businessman in York County, Pennsylvania. Fussell sent his milk to Roots that were located in Baltimore. Fussell also sold cream, but his cream business was often either a hit or a miss and not very consistent. So, Fussell purchased a machine where he was able to use that excess cream, making it into iced cream. He then shipped this iced cream to Baltimore using trains, but this wasn't always very practical, as refrigeration wasn't the best on these trains. The refrigeration systems hadn't been quite perfected at that time as they would eventually become. Fussell moved his business from York County, PA, to Baltimore. 
He built the first ice cream factory in the city of Baltimore, which was located at Hillen and Exeter streets. Before Fussell's ice cream factory, ice cream was considered a dessert that was mainly consumed by the upper class. But starting in 1851, Fussell's ice cream factory helped to make ice cream a treat and a delicacy that was affordable and could be enjoyed by everyone, no matter their place in society. Many Maryland and Baltimore inventions were created by one specific inventor, by the name of William Painter. Painter came to Baltimore in 1839, from Ireland. Over his lifetime, Painter patented over 80 devices, including safety injection seats for passenger trains, a paper folding machine, and a machine to detect counterfeit currency. But his most famous and longest lasting invention was that of the crown bottle cap. In the mid 1800s, the soda industry was booming. But there were many issues with transporting the sometimes volatile carbonated beverages, as there seemed to be no easy way to seal the bottles. Manufacturers would use corks and plugs, but they were not efficient, as the bottles would often pop the corks, spill the soda, or blow up while being transported. Painter got to work and devised a genius method of sealing the tops of the carbonated beverage bottles, using a crown design. The crown bottle tops were one use only, they could either be twisted off or would need the use of a bottle opener, which Painter also invented. Painter's ingenious inventions got him a place in the inventor's hall of fame, and his crown bottle cap invention was so remarkable that we still use it to this day. In 1910, Duncan Black and Alonzo Decker quit their manufacturing jobs, with the intent of spending their time designing a practical tool. They started their own company, and soon went to work designing the world's first portable power tool. In 1917 they received a patent and began manufacturing the first electric drill. They called their new drill manufacturing company Black & Decker. Their half-inch drill featured a universal lightweight electric motor, trigger control, and an easy-to-use pistol grip handle, making the tool easy for just one person to use. Prior to their invention, drills were large, stationary, and needed multiple people to work. Black & Decker is now the largest and most trusted power tool company in the world. Henry Etter Lacks, an African-American woman, was born on a plantation farm in Virginia in 1920. At the age of 21, she moved with her husband David to Dundalk, Maryland. Her husband went to work for Bethlehem Steel in Sparrows Point, Maryland, and served in World War II. With money that they were given by a close friend, they bought a home in the oldest and largest African-American community in Baltimore County, Turner Station. Henry Etter had several children, and she gave birth to her last child in November 1950. The baby was born at Johns Hopkins Hospital. At the time Johns Hopkins was the only hospital in Maryland that treated African-American patients. On the 29th of January 1951, Henry Etter returned to Johns Hopkins, complaining that she felt a knot in her womb. Henry Etter's family thought she might be pregnant again, but actually, she had suffered a severe hemorrhage. While at the hospital, Dr. Howard Jones took a biopsy of the mass found on Henry Etter's cervix and took it for testing in the hospital's laboratory. It was found that she had cervical cancer, and the cancer was malignant. Henry Etter was subsequently treated with radiation therapy. During those treatments, two samples of cells were removed from Henry Etter's cervix without her knowledge or permission. One of these samples was of Henry Etter's healthy cells, the other was of her cancerous cells. The samples were then given to George Otto Gay, who was a physician and cancer researcher at Johns Hopkins. The cancer treatment ultimately did not work for Henry Etter, and she succumbed to the cancer. She passed away at Johns Hopkins on the 4th of October 1951. They conducted an autopsy and found that the cancer had metastasized throughout her entire body. George Otto Gay then studied Henry Etter's cells and found that they were very unusual. The cells could reproduce at a very high rate and could be kept alive long enough to allow more in-depth examination. Up to this point, cells cultured for laboratory studies never survived more than a few days at most, which made it very difficult to perform a variety of tests on the same samples. Henry Etter's cells were the first set of cells that could be divided multiple times without dying. They became known as immortal cells. After Henry Etter's death, George Otto Gay had his lab assistant, Mary Kubitsch, take further samples of cells from Henry Etter's body during the time that the hospital performed their autopsy on her. 
They did this without the family's knowledge or permission. Gay used these cells to start a cell line. He did this by isolating one specific cell and repeatedly dividing it, making it so the same cell could be used for conducting many kinds of medical experiments. These cells became known as HeLa cells. The method to label the cells was to use the first two letters in both the first and last name of the patient. These HeLa cells were used in many scientific and medical breakthroughs. They were used by Dr. Joner Sork, who developed a polio vaccine. They were used in cancer research, to find cures for cancer, for AIDS, and as a base for other vaccinations, including the COVID vaccine. The cells were used to test human sensitivity to items like tape, glue, and cosmetics, among a multitude of products. The cells were used not only in the United States, but throughout the world. In fact, there are almost 11,000 patents that have used the HeLa cells. It's a fact that billions of dollars were made from Henry Etter Lack's incredible cells. Henry Etter's family was completely in the dark about what was going on with these HeLa cells. They would sometimes get out phone calls requesting the use of Henry Etter's cells. These requests were confusing to the family. It wasn't until 1975, almost 25 years after Henry Etter died, that they got word that Henry Etter's unique cells were being used for medical research. There was also the question of privacy, and the fact that consent was never given to harvest Henry Etter's cells in the first place. In March 2013, researchers published the DNA sequence of the genome strands of the HeLa cells. The Lacks family objected to this, as they did not want their genetic information available to the general public. On top of that, they did not see a cent of the billions of dollars that were made off of the HeLa cells. Henry Etter's family decided to right this wrong. They sued Thermo Fisher Scientific in October 2021 for profiting from the HeLa cell line without the family's consent. They were asking for the full amount of Thermo Fisher's net profits. On the 31st of July 2023, Thermo Fisher Scientific settled with the Lax family under undisclosed terms. It should be noted that Henry Etter Lax is an unsung and unwitting hero. Because of her very unique and very significant cells, she has helped to save countless lives and will continue to do so in the years to come. As her cells are considered immortal, Henry Etter is also immortal. She is one Marylander, most of us can thank for helping to make all of our lives better. Here are a few more interesting facts about the state of Maryland. The USS Constellation, which is docked in Baltimore's Inner Harbor, is the last ship to survive the Civil War. It is still as it used to be, and is a great place to tour, should you find yourself at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Sailing is a big deal in Annapolis. Many local shops and restaurants close on Wednesdays in the summer, for the weekly races that are held there. Annapolis is also the host of the National Sailing Hall of Fame, and the Annapolis Maritime Museum. At one time, Annapolis was considered the sailing capital of the world. One of the oldest and still continuously operating lighthouses, is the Concord Point Lighthouse. The lighthouse is located in Haver de Grace, it was built in 1827 and is the northernmost lighthouse on the Chesapeake Bay. Its first keeper was John O'Neill, who was a hero of the War of 1812. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge is a jewel bridge that crosses on Route 50, between Kent Island and Annapolis. It is officially named the William Preston Lane Jr. Memorial Bridge, but the locals refer to it simply as the Bay Bridge. The bridge is 4.2 miles long and is one of the longest overwater structures in the world. The first bridge, which when it opened, was only two lanes, opened on July 1952. They expanded the bridge due to the increasing traffic conditions, adding a second bridge and two more lanes, in June 1973. The Bay Bridge is considered one of the scariest bridges in America. It is both a tall and a long bridge, so someone with a fear of heights may not be able to cross it with ease. But for many, it is not a big deal. It will get closed down if the weather is not ideal and traffic patterns will change on the bridge, if the traffic is too congested. All of this can cause more anxiety for drivers going across the bridge. They have a cottage industry of drivers who will help to drive people back and forth across the bridge if they are too scared to make the trip on their own. But, no matter what, the Bay Bridge is another adventure in the state of Maryland, and a must drive if you are heading to the beaches of Ocean City. The Great Baltimore Fire raged in Baltimore from Sunday, February 7th to Monday, February 8th, 1904. 
It destroyed more than 1,500 buildings in an area of some 140 acres. It was considered the third worst disaster of any large American city, surpassed only by the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 and the San Francisco Earthquake and Fire of 1906. Despite fire engines coming to help to put out the fire from nearby cities such as Philadelphia, Washington DC, New York City, Wilmington, and Atlantic City, not one of them could help in the end. They found there was a problem getting the fire wagons to work, as the hose couplings for most of the neighboring city's fire wagons just did not fit the hose couplings for Baltimore. This incompatibility of the fire hose couplings prevented the ability to hook up the fire hoses to the water system, thereby making it impossible to put out the ever-growing fire. This tragic problem ended up causing the destruction of the city to intensify. After the heartbreaking loss of property, the city of Baltimore did get rebuilt rather quickly. But the greatest legacy to come from this tragedy was the efforts to standardize firefighting equipment throughout the entire country, so that all fire companies would have the same standard equipment available to them, most especially hose couplings. In 1828, German immigrant Francis Beeler founded the first umbrella manufacturing company in the United States, the Beeler Umbrella Factory. His factory spawned a large number of imitators. But by the early 20th century, Baltimore was shipping out more than one and a half million umbrellas annually. They were the leader of the pack in umbrella manufacturing at that time. On the 23rd of June 1784, Peter Kahns, a lawyer and tavern owner from Bladensburg, was inspired by the reports of how the Montgolfier brothers of France successfully experimented with hot air flight. Their hot air flight took place in 1783. Kahn's wanted to recreate the experiment with his own hot air balloon. He built his balloon using similar specs that the Montgolfier brothers used. Kahn's announced to the Baltimore papers that he would be launching his own balloon and invited everyone to come and witness it. A large group of interested onlookers gathered at the Walnut Street prison to watch the spectacle of his hot air balloon flight. Too large to fly in the balloon himself, Kahn's used 13-year-old Edward Warren as the balloon's pilot. The flight was successful, and it touched off the interest of others, who also wanted to experience for themselves the excitement of this new kind of experimental transportation. Elijah Bond, a lawyer and inventor in Baltimore, patented the Ouija board. He filed for the patent on the 28th of May 1890. William Fold, a businessman, an entrepreneur, who was also from Baltimore, took over the production of the boards from 1890 through the 1920s. Fold, though he did not invent the Ouija board, was still considered the father of the Ouija board, being that he was the one who distributed it and made it very popular. Another interesting fact on this is that Elijah Bond's headstone is a replica of his Ouija board design. You can find the headstone at the Green Mount Cemetery in Baltimore. The Maryland flag is the most unique state flag in the country. It is the only flag that is based on British hierarchy. The black and gold design on the quartered flag is based on the coat of arms of the Calvert family, the first Lord Baltimore. Harriet Tubman, the famous abolitionist, was born, a Raminter, Minty, Ross, into slavery in Dorchester County, Maryland. As a child, she was hired out to take care of other children, to work in the fields and to do forest work, and to check on muskrat traps. She married John Tubman, who was a freeman, and then changed her name to Harriet Tubman. Harriet escaped her bondage, heading north to Philadelphia in 1849. She traveled alone and mostly at night, evading capture. After securing her freedom, she decided to help other enslaved persons escape. She made around 13 trips between 1850 and 1860, going back and forth from her childhood home of Maryland, liberating some 70 people, including her parents and many of her siblings. In doing so, she often risked her life. During the Civil War, Harriet worked for the Union Army, first as a cook and nurse, and then as an armed scout and spy. In 1863, she became the first woman to lead an armed expedition in the war, liberating more than 700 slaves. Maryland, along with the state of Virginia, each gave up land to help establish the new federal district of Washington, D.C. in 1790. That area of Maryland closest to the United States Capitol is still considered part of the Washington, D.C. corridor. In 1939, a Jewish-German immigrant and wholesale spice business owner named Gustav Brun arrived in Baltimore after being released from a concentration camp in Ettersburg, Germany. Gustav's family had successfully bribed several German Nazi soldiers into letting him go unharmed. 
Once he was able to make his escape from Germany and the Nazis, he went to America and came to Baltimore. Once in Baltimore, Brune knew he could seize upon the love that Marylanders had for crab and seafood, and he worked tirelessly to produce a spice mixture that he called the delicious shrimp and crab seasoning. The spice he created was later named Old Bay, after a passenger ship line that sailed across the Chesapeake between Maryland and Virginia. In the 1990s, McCormick and company bought the rights to Old Bay and continues to manufacture the spice in Maryland. The Old Bay seasoning's recipe is secret, with around 20 ingredients. It is hard to recreate, though many have tried. And just know, if you come to Maryland, they put Old Bay seasoning on just about everything. It's more than just a tradition here. And speaking of McCormick and company, they are one of the largest manufacturers of spices in the world. And they got their start in Baltimore. There are many major companies that got their start, or are headquartered in Maryland. These include Black and Decker, Choice Hotels, Coventry Healthcare, Discovery Communications, Geico Insurance, Goodwill Industries, Johns Hopkins, which is one of the top hospitals in the United States, Joseph, a bank clothiers, Lockheed Martin, London Fog, Marriott International, Purdue Farms, Piedmont Airlines, Radio One, Sinclair Broadcast Group, Sylvan Learning, T. Rowe Price Group, The Ritz Carlton Hotel Company, and Under Armour. We already know that Harriet Tubman and Francis Scott Key came from Maryland, and here are other major historical figures to come from the state. These include Edgar Allan Poe, Babe Ruth, Frederick Douglass, Alger Hiss, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, former Vice President Spro Agnew, and John Wilkes Booth. There are quite a number of famous people to come from Maryland. And here are just a few. Writer Tom Clancy, CNN anchor Aaron Burnett, news anchor Connie Chung, journalist Frank DeFord, Matt Drudge of The Drudge Report, author Dashiell Hammett, journalist Julia Yaffe, journalist Gail King, author H. L. Mencken, best-selling author Nora Roberts, author Leon Uris, Frederick Whitfield, Adrian Rich, James Walcott, singer Tori Amos, UB Blake, Tony Broxton, David Byrne, Cab Calloway, singer Cass Elliott, Adam Juritz, Billie Holiday, Joan Jett, Greg Kinn, Lisa Loeb, Nils Lofgren, Frank Zappa, Tupac Shakur, Chick Webb, actress Karen Allen, Bess Armstrong, John Aston, Jonathan Banks, Comedian Lewis Black, Hans Can Read, Comedian Whitney Cummings, Tommy Davidson, Divine, Charles Dutton, Robert Duvall, Anna Faris, Judah Friedlander, Kathy Lee Gifford, John Glover, Linda Hamilton, Baker and Star Chef Duff Goldman, David Hasselhoff, Goldie Horn, Robert Hayes, Taraji P. Henson, Rian Johnson, Spike Jones, Martin Lawrence, Barry Levinson, Julia Louis Dreyfus, William H. Macy, Deborah Monk, Robin Quivers, Lance Reddick, Patricia Richardson, Howard Rollins, Mark Rolston, Mike Rowe, Jonathan Sheck, Richard Schiff, Dwight Schultz, Anna Devere Smith, Jader Pinkett Smith, Daniel Stern, Wonder Sykes, John Waters, talk show host Montel Williams, basketball player Carmelo Anthony, football coach Bill Belichick, gymnast Dominic Doors, boxer Sugar Ray Leonard, baseball player Cal Ripken Jr., Pam Shriver, Reggie Williams, journalist Carl Bernstein, Riddick Bowe, Len Bias, Kevin Durant, Michael Phelps, Katie Ledecky, Parker Posey, Josh Charles, Ben Stein, Sylvester Stallone, Edward Norton, 
Julie Bowen. Entrepreneur Johns Hopkins. Entrepreneur Frank Pajou. Philanthropist George Peabody. John Carroll, the first Roman Catholic bishop in the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Thanks again for watching this episode of What Makes the State of Maryland So Special. If I missed anything, or if you want to share your own interesting facts about the state of Maryland, please leave a comment below. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and also look out for more videos like this one. We intend to highlight all 50 states and US territories. So, stay tuned for more videos, and please, also, share them with your friends. Thanks again, and see you very soon.